accept the work. And not, not really to not suffer, but to actually thrive. And so you know, these are just some of the disciplines, engineering, economics, health, positive psychology, and their grand visions of human flourishing. But we need something a, a, a much more transdisciplinary. And I think we're, we're making some headway. We're making some headway there. Um, here, I'm just going to add a few more. If you decide to dive into this, right, then let's say a quick, easy one is Arthur Brooks has a column at the Atlantic. Um, he's a former executive at AEI. He's now over at uh, Harvard at the, Kennedy, um, at the Kennedy School. And one of the things you'll start to see are different takes, psychological perspectives, philosophical perspectives, we're we'll talking about Aristotle, neuroscientific, so you know, look at the neurobiology of our brain and how that correlates to uh, emotion or well-being or health, sociological, looking at our relationships, and again, we give them the economic perspective. All of these have something valuable to offer, but uh, offered only in isolation prevents us from seeing the holistic part. Right? And so the holistic part has to encompass much more um, than just a single uh, discipline. In this uh, talk, right, my proposal uh, here is as we think about these various disciplines, is to remember the uh, physical, the mental and intellectual, emotional and the metaphysical uh, aspects of the human experience. And that these four dimensions are sufficient enough for us to go ahead and grapple with the questions holistically. Not just do you have enough money and you should be good, or hey, you know what, you have a roof over your head, um, you know, that's sufficient. We find out more and more and more that the material things are actually secondary to more of the emotional and relational things. So um, I'll skip to this one. The ultimate, uh, when you say, hey, what is, what is happiness? I'm going to give you the, the short piece and then I'll get into the next section. Then for us, the proposal about happiness is that happiness is actually human flourishing. So regardless of what's context, right? Um, regardless of one's content, one can actually attain some sort of flourishing within their life. Now, how would this work? Like, how would this contrast to other notions of thinking about happiness? Aristotle actually thought, when they, they talked about happiness, uh, or some philosophers thought that happiness was only obtainable by those who are good looking, or those who are elite or rich or well skilled, right? Or those who didn't have any, uh, weren't living with any uh, disabilities. What we find often from the research is context matters and context influences our own experience, but it doesn't have the ultimate governing say on whether or not we can flourish in that context. So many times you'll hear these paradox about those who, much have, who might have more or less material goods, and yet they flourish on more dimensions than places as rich as our country. And so for us, uh, when we talk about happiness, this is happiness as human flourishing, flourishing in all those dimensions that I uh, that I just mentioned. There are a few, and I know that Paradox of Happiness is a good uh, is a good book. Um, one other one that I'll plug in here is the Oxford book um, by Haybron, H E Y B R O N. Small story is like this, and it gives a, a short introduction into some of the happiness studies over the past uh, maybe two decades or three decades, uh, and it summarizes some of them. He likes to think about it uh, in terms of, we say human flourishing. He talks about it in terms of engagement, endorsement, and attunement. And meaning, well, are you happy in your life or are you happy um, with your life? And so those are, you know, when we're thinking about you know, happiness, uh, we're talking really the better context for that is thinking about human flourishing. Then comes our next question. I said, can you measure happiness? How do people try to measure economics, right? It's really measured on utility. For engineering, it's measured on physical metrics. For nursing and for the health sciences, is often the absence of disease. But let me give you an insight into some of the ways that very large organizations and local organizations have been trying to measure happiness. For the most part, they strive to measure our positive to negative emotion, right? They strive to measure um, subjective well-being. Right, and so here, there's data being collected on life satisfaction. This is as if I were to come up to you and ask you what is the other to 10. How satisfied are you with your life? 
And so this is Gap Finder. They do this on income and life expectancy, education. There's a World Happiness Report um, that incorporates economics, technology, national statistics on health, economic production. And then there are these other global indicators, all striving to measure the same thing this happiness or this human flourishing. Right, this human development index, index of economic freedom, the global peace index, global competitiveness, uh, uh, competitiveness index, environmental protection index. But the fact of the matter is, many of them are often disconnected and mentioning one dimension. Let me give you an example. Over in, uh, in Europe, the Nordic countries, oftentimes they're cited as being some of the happiest countries. And yet, some of these countries that rate really high on this life satisfaction or this objective well-being, they also measure high in terms of suicide rates. And so there you kind of see the enigma, you see the paradox, that in some of the ways that we try to measure happiness by simply asking, hey, how, are you, how satisfied are you with your, with your life? It doesn't fully capture everything going on in the overall human experience. And so as you look at these data sets, and as you look at these you know, measurements, it's important to ask the question, do these capture the full dimensions of human flourishing or the full dimensions of happiness? We are much more complex than a simple, you know, than, than a simple study or let alone a numeric uh, study. I'm not really going to go through this, but I wanted to point out, again, this is someone's proposal of trying to use statistics to get these metrics to kind of line up. Right? What I will point out is, hey, you can measure, these are all from what I just mentioned to you, those in the, in the previous ones, and they're trying to correlate. But here in this table alone, they're just trying to correlate one to one, like two, two metrics alone. And dare I say, like, again, it continues to be insufficient because it can't completely answer many of the questions around social phenomena of how well they're flourish. Here's the, here's the interesting one. You can go ahead and access this yourself on the world data. Uh, but this is your self-reported life satisfaction. Okay? So let me ask the question, and maybe you can answer it yourself and say, hey, what do you mind? Right? But this is the US. Please imagine a ladder with steps numbered from zero at the bottom to 10 at the top. The top of the ladder represents the best possible life for you, and the bottom of the ladder represents the worst possible life for you. On um, which step in the ladder would you say you personally feel you stand in this time? Now, I don't need to go ahead and collect your uh, data, but what I can share with you is here's been the United States uh, over the past, uh, in some years, past uh, decade. Can you see where they are? Right? Sevens. Now, this is kind of interesting when you think about it. Because for most of us, I, I think there's a bit of a cliches in terms of how we respond. If I were to come up to you and we were in person, I said, hey, good morning, how are you doing? What is the common response? The common response is that I'm okay. I'm doing good. I can be hurting, I can be broken, right? I can be at a stressful, you know, a stressful morning. And yet, uh, oftentimes, right, we're like, hey, overall, in, in the scheme of things, I'm, I'm doing all right. Like seven, uh, you know, a little bit above. I, you know, maybe I can't complain uh, too much. And so this captures, where this falls short is, it doesn't always capture the dynamic. Because oftentimes when you're conditioned, then you respond to how are you doing, good morning, how is life going, I'm doing all right. Or I'm good, good, but I'm busy. Um, you know, uh, you could be better, you can't complain, all sorts of things. But uh, it doesn't always tease out the intimate details, and especially the fluctuations uh, within uh, Within society or in a person's life. This is a fun one. I'm going to sit on this for a little bit. I realize it's almost a, you know, a decade old. But what you're looking at here is that same life satisfaction question. Okay? And then all the countries, the size of the circles are just the size of their populations. Okay? And so you can see, oh, where is everybody, you know, where is everybody ranked, right? So 10 is all the way up here. Nobody in that 10. But I told you about the Netherlands a little bit earlier. Right here is us, right? the US, Japan, China, here's uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Liberia, you know, Burundi, Rwanda. So you can see the spread of countries. So this is a global 
uh, a global sort of thing. And you know, one of the things that people often uh, talk about is, okay, well, here's our, you know, this is all stretched out by GDP. Okay? So we have the higher GDP in the US. And so there seems to be a trend, somewhat of a similarity, but somewhat of a, uh, a trend of the more things you have, the more productive your economy is, the likely you're going to give yourself a higher life satisfaction. Now the fact of the matter is like it's in some in some ways it has an influence and it is true. So I would say yes and no. Right? Here this GDP right goes up. But then how do you explain places, for example, like Costa Rica, whose whose economy is not nearly the size, whose GDP per capita is not nearly as high, right, as some place like uh, like the US, and yet remains a lot higher in self satisfaction. These complexities against T's and out, right, while GDP or context can have an influence, they ultimately don't have most of the, the governing say on whether or not we can flourish, right, on whether or not there's a limit based on our context um, to, our, to our happiness. These are fun things to, you know, to tease out, especially as you, you, you compare them, right? Uh, compare economies, compare this, but we'll get to the something called the Easterman paradox. Toward the um, toward the end of the, the talk. Um, oh, actually, I had, it, I, I had it here. Well, I guess I'll just explain it now. I had it here. It's already the other stuff. Here, what you're looking at, right? So, up to 2016, it was 1972. Is you are seeing happiness, right? This life satisfaction or subjective well-being survey. And then on the other side, you're seeing GDP per capita. Notice here, you start to see it, you know, there's its level, it jumps up, it jumps down, and then you start to see it take a dip. And here's where you start to see a bit of divergence. Recognizing that up until a certain level, you know, your context, your material means uh, matter. But then after that, uh, it no longer correlates. Right? Recent studies, and I guess I can explain, I'll explain these, uh, these now, but recent studies have shown this that uh, self-satisfaction or somebody's happiness surveys correlate with an increase in income, um, household income, probably up to about $75,000, $80,000. And after that, really what determines a lot of your self-satisfaction self or life satisfaction is relative income. Right? And I'll tell two stories. One is uh, those in the community, and most of them you know, um, earn about the same, but they were actually below the median income for the national. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, they were below the median income for their uh, for their state. And yet, when measured on self satisfaction, life satisfaction, many of them paired you know, um, performed well. Um, take, uh, there was a sampling of those who made a significant amount of money, and you know, we were thinking about. Uh, hedge fund managers and things like that. And there was a guy who was extraordinarily upset, disappointed, uh, frustrated, and angry, right? And it's because uh, the person, right, he had his bonus from this hedge fund, and it was to the tune of a few hundred thousand dollars. But what made him super unhappy was the fact that somebody else got money. And so this, this phenomenon, this relative income, actually plays out quite a bit. If you look at your circle and you kind of compare it, you compare these relative incomes, oftentimes that's the range at which we calibrate our self-satisfaction, especially when it comes to, to GDP. But yeah, many times on a, on a national scale, that's been shown to be a, after a household income of you know, 75 or eight, like it, you know, it starts to be beat right on, on the large scale. Thought I had this one, uh, this one later. So here, uh, oh, that's uh, kind of the same one I want to point out. Here's a very interesting one for data. And I'll, I'll skip off the data in a, in a little bit. We'll get to some other stuff on uh, your misconceptions. But this is a very unique graph. What you're seeing it on the left, okay, this, this, this part right here. So as you go up, up and down on the scale, says this is asking all of us our guess of how much of the population answered that they were very happy or rather happy. So I, if you were asking me if I were to ask, well, how, many, uh, how happy is, you know, what's the percentage of people happy here? 
And so I would answer here. And then so you can say, you can say 20%, 30% of the population is going to say they're very happy, 50, 60, 70. You can answer wherever you want. Now over here on the bottom, what it's compared to is the actual share of people in that same country that answered that they were very happy or rather happy. Now this is interesting because the people who answered for themselves highlighted very much so that they were very happy or rather happy. Right? This is that uh, seven or eight point scale that, they, uh, that I showed you a bit earlier, especially for the, for the US, they answered very, very happy. Very happy or, or rather happy. Um, yet most of the people who estimated, right, this is in, let's say, about 80 to 90 percent, people actually said they were very happy or rather happy. Everybody else guessed that people were not happy. Everybody else said there was a much smaller percentage of people who answered that question. Said that they were more depressed, that they were, they, they were um, less happy. This is an interesting phenomenon when it comes to actually social sciences, when it comes to some of these surveys, but also our perception. Our perception of you know, other people's lives, of what's going on in our, in our states, in our cities, in our schools, um, here in our country, in the, dare I say, maybe in our, in our culture, in this, um, what we see. Uh, you know, news is primarily negative. Um, I, I agree with the term, right? There's uh, in, in, in a lot of mass media, uh, there's a lot of what they call the outrage industrial complex, where it's you know, just often meant to get people uh, upset. And so maybe those things that we uh, subscribe to or that we consume often give us this perception uh, that many people are less happier than they actually uh, indicate. So fun things, interesting things about measuring happiness. Now, the question you know, then becomes, well, is this happiness thing, is this happiness for them important? Should we pay attention to it? Um, what's going on? Well, I, you know, my guess is that many of you have seen uh, when the Surgeon General came out and said we have an epidemic of loneliness. 60 million U.S. Americans, no, U.S. Americans, right? Uh, no, right? Uh, according to many of the, of the surveys or any of the different uh, polls. What is, what is happening? Why is it? Why is that, you know, uh, cities are tested this very against, uh, you know, whether it's uh, anxiety, depression, overdose, um, you know, suicide, those continue uh, to rise. Um, for those of 20 something in the survey, right? I mean, sorry, uh, a survey of 20 something, 20, 20, 20, um, 20 years around the country. And for them, uh, they predicted that they wouldn't be as happy as a generation one. Life expectancy. Very interesting what's happening in our country. Um, for the first time in decades, first time in decades, life expectancy in the United States has gone down. Now you might attribute that to hey, some of the increase in the deaths of this world. You might increase to uh, you know, other things, but our life expectancy has gone uh, has gone down. Now I know I'm like you know, making this kind of depressing piece. Uh, let me cite some other things about that are positive. Or hey, this is why it's important to look at human flourishing and happiness. John Manuel Martinez actually just recently came out with a study, uh, and what happened was over the past five years they had asked all the Fortune uh, 1100 uh, companies. These are country companies that are as big as you know, Fortune 100 or Fortune 500. But across the board for several years. Are you happy at work? Um, are you, uh, you find meaning in your work? Um, are you frustrated? Um, and, and there was one more that I'm forgetting right now. But just those four questions repeatedly asked. And it was so interesting because they could predict, regardless of what was going on in the economy, regardless of the inflation rate, regardless of uh, COVID, regardless of um, you know, other circumstances happening in that specific industry how the company would be feeling. And with just those four questions, it actually gave a pretty good or a decent assessment in those 1,100 companies about the state of their human resources, the human capital. And so for us, happiness in terms of thriving, in, our, in terms of helping our organizations, uh, seems to be very, very important, especially for performance. For countries, states, communities, teams, and families, um, this human flourishing aspect gets at the heart of you know, them thriving. So there are initiatives in certain countries um, around looking at happiness and uh, human flourishing. 
But oftentimes, many of the and, and oftentimes many at the lower scale are communities or teams or families. Uh, you know, cited as important. Whenever surveying, like, you know, is this something significant? Why is this significant? It's significant because of the nutrition. Uh, let me give you another positive story. Uh, there was uh, a study on uh, some children, and it was um, a comparative study between a city here in the U.S., children from a city here in the U.S., and one from, I believe, uh, Panama. And what they did was they started comparing um, you know, how do students, you know, where they're at, their, their context, you know, what resources they, um, they have. But as they started to actually uh, talk about, you know, to children, you know, about um, hope and flourishing and things like that, what they found is that compared to those that weren't engaged in similar programs, right, they had much less risky behavior, where this is, you know, violence, where this is, um, you know, adolescent uh, crimes or things like that in both places. So across countries, cross cultural, they're finding that they're engaged in a lot of less um, risky behavior. Final thing I'll put up here for is happiness really important, or is it something that just is really a byproduct of all these other uh, dimensions? Well, it turns out that for policy, let's say you're a policy wonk and you have an idea of a certain policy you like to put forward whether it's on um, you know, uh, green spaces or workforce development or you know, funding our, some of our basic services and municipal services. It turns out that when you're designing a policy for an organization or for a community, that the well-being metrics, these happiness and like life satisfaction or all the, you know, these other human flourishing metrics, help explain why people respond to the incentives or not. So you can have the best program, the best policy model ever, and create the best uh, your proposal. And yet, if you have the best proposal, but you don't have you know, this, um, you, you don't have these metrics, or they're not doing well, they actually won't respond to your policy interventions, right? as well as they would if you actually address some of these others. I heard something, was that just the, the same or is there a question? You could? Okay, I'll assume there was, I'll assume there, uh, there was. One of the motivations for us and the exciting things that are happening at, at, in different places. So, Coursera, uh, you know, over with the um, you know, some of the other colleges, there is starting to be a lot more conversation addressing these human flourishing elements. Now, why? Uh, for some of the positive implications of what they can do to help us thrive and move forward and develop, but some of it's a response to what's happening to our next generation, our Gen Zers. Right? What is it? What are they coming into? I intentionally teach in a first year program, in a first year engineering program, because I want to feel uh, what's coming in. I want to feel in terms of their affect, their engagement, their excitement, their hopes, their dreams, you know, what's the uh, major barriers for them. And um, this gives you a sample, right, from some of the surveys done. 45% of students surveyed were too depressed to function. And this is not, this is a subset, this is not a full national survey. 50% of this. Two thirds had overwhelming anxiety. Two thirds were very lonely. 87% overwhelmed by academic um, academic stress, and 13% considering suicide. And for us, it wasn't, uh, the curriculum you know, didn't change as, as much, but it turns out that the culture has. And the launch of the Engineering Happiness Initiative or the Human Flourishing Initiative was meant to engage some of these, you know, these students in these types of meaningful conversations about what their own dreams were, about meaning and purpose in their life, um, about what they're capable of doing, developing good habits, developing virtues, and things like that. And I must say that while you look at all these stats on here, the happiness and human flourishing class, uh, just from, I uh, you, you just use PIT, is a thriving uh, counter to all these stats. You have students coming out 
much more resilient, right? Uh, actually stating a lot more um, you know, positively about you know, what's going to, to happen. And the reason why is we don't shy away from some of the larger questions that they implicitly ask. Right, like these questions on, uh, especially on meaning, on purpose, on relationships, on success, um, and as we're able to kind of grapple and wrestle with them in this larger context, uh, for them it actually gives them a much, uh, much more confidence uh, in terms of addressing the challenges ahead, because it won't be, it won't be that easy. So, a very interesting thing that's happening here. Can I just, uh, I'm going to put a pause here. Can I get a, make sure I'm on that same, in terms of the time check? Like how much more? It's 12. How many more can I go to Q&A? Yeah, he's good. Wanna give him a thumbs up? He can see you guys. I'm not sure he's asking. Say it again, so I don't think I heard it. 15 minutes. Okay, perfect. And then, so I'll let him do about maybe about five more uh, minutes and then I'll go ahead and uh, wrap up if that's okay. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Pretty good. <laughs> Okay, so now that I talked about what is happiness, can you measure happiness, um, you know, some of the important, maybe I should think that I'm going to get to um, maybe a couple of misconceptions, and then how we should actually move uh, forward in the spirit of being proactive and being able to this, uh, this topic and this paradigm. So how should we think about flourishing? You can think about it in two ways enough to capture your work. happiness in your life and happiness with your life. There are so many dimensions, especially when it comes to physical and mental well-being, about the happiness in your life, right? Uh, whether it's your level of energy, whether it's your actual <coughs> ability, um, in some places you're having enough to eat. There are dimensions that are about happiness in your life. And the happiness with your life often is a bit more intrinsic in terms of, uh, more existential, in terms of the meaning and purpose of your life. And this has to do with, well, what are my ultimate goals and what are my ultimate desires? But these two questions often get at most of the dimensions when we talk about <coughs> flourishing. So if you want to move to talk about happiness and we are human flourishing, happiness in your life and happiness with your life, or excellent uh, discussion questions for yourself or even with your, your family. Just ask them, are you happy with your life or are you happy in your life? Here's some misconceptions. I talked about the Eastern paradox and money. Uh, I'll talk about some of these other uh, pieces. Okay, uh, there is a book called Five Events on Death and Dying, and it was some nurses over in Australia who worked in hospice. And what they did was they interviewed many of their patients. And what they found on these regrets on death and dying was that um, for them at the very end, none of it had to do with athletes. Right? So money, it didn't have to do with having more money. They weren't there thinking, I wish I made more money. Uh, for the accolades, they weren't thinking, oh, I wish I actually was, you know, gotten um, this credential. I went to, you know, and I got this, uh, you know, position. For many of them, it wasn't about uh, awards. Now, when it comes to success, success and achievement, uh, many times those are correlated, people implicitly correlate them with, I'll be happy when I get this next raise, when I get this next promotion, when I'm your big boss, when I you know, make a certain amount of, I have a certain amount of financial independence. The data bears that it's not necessarily, it, that's not necessarily the case. Now for students, that correlates often with grades. And I wanted to point this out. If you look at the bottom here, it says, uh, high grades are actually a negative correlation with self-esteem, happiness, and optimism. So this, is funny because I remember a dean a long time ago telling me, it's like, oh, your students, here's what happens. Your A students become your professors, the B students become their bosses, the C students go to the suite, right, the CEOs and the chief operating officers, and the D students become your donors. And uh, uh, it's hilarious, right, because of the fact that I was like, yeah, I don't think that GPA is not really predictive about long-term success. And most of all, about long term, uh, long term happiness. Um, but yeah, I talked about my essay, happiness aversion. Here's the last piece I kind of want to get to. 
The Harvard Adult Development Study is the longest study for adult development or human development uh, known. It started in the 1920s, and there have been three directors. So what did they do? Well, they took a class of you know, uh, people at Harvard, and they just monitored their lives. Right? Uh, they would actually bring them in every two years, and they would measure you know, uh, physical traits, medical traits, and they would also conduct interviews with them right, about how they were doing. So you got, well, again, these tangible uh, metrics, uh, you know, height, weight, health, things like that. But you also have the elements about how they're doing with respect to their um, their profession, with respect to their their standing. And as they went through, uh, they measured that generation, and then as that generation started to have uh, family and kids, they measured that generation. And then that second generation again is flourishing, like they had their own families with you know and, and had great kids. And so right now, they're in the midst of measuring even the fourth generation. And so they're looking at these cross-generational attributes of what seems to be you know, the biggest parameters. And what's interesting when they ask all body groups, I saw him in June up in uh, Boston, uh, they interviewed him and they asked him of all the metrics that you have right, for happiness. And he's like, well, what, what, what stands out to you? If you're coaching somebody on happiness, what are the key elements? And so, you know, my reaction was, well, you're probably going to talk about your know, diet and exercise. I think that's going to be there. Uh, not using, you know, not using, you know, alcohol or drugs and things like that. That would be there. But that's not what he mentioned. He said, if I were to coach somebody on one thing and one thing only, from which so many other metrics have a ripple effect, he said it was relationships. Relationships create this resilient, maybe even a halo effect on so many of the other parameters. Relationships are the things that allow us, or insulate us, from maybe some of the financial stress, or the social stress, right, or the personal stress, or the physical stress that comes to us in our you know, daily lives, in our families, in our communities, in our, in our schools. We said relationships seem to be a larger piece. Now he said, hey, that, that you just work on a relationship and don't and avoid everything else, but he said, of the ones that seem to have the most staying power, it is these uh, relationships. Oops. Oh, and so uh, here, oh, let me just do this one. So I want to give you one little exercise that we have. Uh, for relationships, there is these levels of intimacy. And in these levels of intimacy, what they talk about is, um, you know, how, how well you know other people. So for example, you might have been meeting some people a day, and you've never met them. Hi, how are you doing? And you might have just talked about maybe some current events. Um, okay, so that's you know, the order of cliche. The second level, the intimacy level above that, the second level, often talks about facts. Like, hey, how's the weather today? Is it snowing? You know, it's snowing like Pittsburgh. Oh, it's rough getting in. It's pretty cold. Then we have more weather. That's in the level of facts. Uh, for those who root for you know your favorite sports team, right? You might start to get into things level three, which is about current opinions and beliefs. Um, right? It's like, oh, I think this is the best team. I think this is where we should go. Then after that is this one: hopes and dreams. The level of intimacy. You are intimate with somebody when you actually share your hopes and dreams. This is one really, really good way to inject um, you know some life into a variety of our relationships. And what that does is it allows them to be intimate and share something that's uh, that's theirs, that the individual is theirs. Allows them to be vulnerable by sharing some of their hopes and dreams, and allows you to be able to uh, listen to actually see where they're at. And so this hopes and dreams exercise is uh, what we give to some of our students is a meeting to your family and friends about their hopes and dreams. Right? As you do that, this is one of the many, many, many ways of rekindling or building on relationships that you uh, that you have. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, you know stop right. Well, let me let me do one last uh, one last thing for the hopes and dreams. Um, the biggest the biggest classes out there around happiness or human flourishing are on cognitive psychology. Cognitive psychology can be broken down to these three things: they focus on your thoughts, and your feelings, and behavior. There's a class on Coursera, it's open uh, by Lori Sanders. It's the most popular class on Coursera ever. Um, millions and millions and millions of students from across 
across the world. I don't know, it's four million or three million uh, that have, have taken it. But in there, they invite you to do different exercises, to think about the habits, your, your habits of your thought, your thoughts, how you actually recognize your thoughts, or aware of your thoughts, manage your thoughts, process them. Same thing with your feelings, and same thing with your, with your behavior. But these elements right here, when it comes to happiness, are the practical ways of engaging, uh, you know, uh, engaging others to have a more flourishing family, a more flourishing community, and you know, hopefully a more flourishing you know, country and world. So, uh, thank you very much. I am looking forward to your questions or comments or uh, feedback. I appreciate all of your uh, attention. And thank you again for having me. Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay. I'm curious about your study with college students and if you looked at the different ma uh, majors and if there was any relationship. You being an engineering person, I've always heard that, that mathematics is what stops engineering students from succeeding rather than the engineering classes. And I'm, I'm a former math teacher, so, <laughs> so that bothers me. So I, I'm just curious, especially with your particular background, found any interesting data there. Thank you very for the for the question. So let me give two examples. One in our happiness and human version class that we have, it runs the gamut of everybody uh, there are 70 students enrolled for this semester. And so we have a representation of all sorts of disciplines. Political science, nursing, you know, uh, psychology, engineering, um, math, right? Um, and so all, all these. And for many of them, in that course, um, I would say all of them, you know, all of them thrive, all of them do well, all of them respond very, very well to uh, questions and the challenges, the projects, uh, to for them to engage their, their life. So there wasn't one that necessarily precluded them from participating in the flourishing aspect. Now, let me get back to your other uh, your question. I think it seems, and I'm speaking anecdotally from my own experience, the way I came across this happiness and human flourishing was some of the first year students would ask me out to dinner. And so I would call home and say, hey, you know, the, there's a lot of group of students, they want to go out, so I would schedule a dinner. Uh, I'd go out with them, and they just spread about their life, how engineering was going, how, uh, how tough things were, or what things were going well. And you could see, especially for engineers, there was this existential angst. But what I found out as I actually engaged other students was they shared, many of them shared the same fears. So let me talk to you about the five fears for many of our students. Five fears. I am only as good as my last success. Meaning I was successful in high school, but that doesn't mean I'm worthy or valuable now. I have to go ahead and be successful again in order to be that. So I'm only as good as my last success. My GPA is my identity. That's what they, that's a that's a fear like, that if their GPA is lower, that they cannot somehow overcome that. That that is governing to the rest of their life. Um, another fear, and this is shared across disciplines across majors. Um, the other one is, oh, uh, I am missing out. Or there's this fear of missing out. So, if somebody, it's like a, a zero sum game. If somebody got a great internship down in West Virginia and I didn't get it, like I'm missing out. Right, so there's this, uh, again, a zero-sum game where they are feeling like they're missing out. In their own discipline, across this, you know, in their own major, um, there's a fear about, I'm the only person who doesn't get it and can't be successful, especially in engineering. They're like, I can't get it. They will see some other people thrive and do well, and they're gifted academic, and automatically they would actually assume that they were the only ones in the, in the class, the state, you know, the, the campus, the country that didn't get it. And the last one, and this is again shared across majors, was um, that I'm stupid and I'm worried. You know, that they, they had this really in, embedded. And so I think all of them share those fears. I think certain things are uh, accentuated in, in, in some of our majors, but uh, I would say, at large, many of the students share those same uh, fears and, uh, and challenges. Thank you for the question. It's a great question. Maybe I should ask the audience if they're happy. 
Thank you all very much. I hope you have a wonderful day. You are